Oh, that's great. Uh, you got to imagine it with me. Imagine a lonely prisoner sitting quietly, writing, pauses and thinks, adds another sentence to a letter. The letters are some really good friends, and he's th- this lonely prisoner is thinking back at his early childhood and remembered all of my dreams. I did it. I fulfilled them all. And it was a lot. Went to absolutely the finest of schools, colleges. Studied with scholars of all well-known names. High status in a religious organization, like at the top was actually considered blameless even according to the law and what was kept, even to the silliest and the smallest of detail. It helped that as he looks back, his parents, it, the, the heritage was, well, in fact, the heritage was so great that it wasn't just the parents, goes back, was going back nearly 1,500 years in heritage to the very earliest of their religion. One of the few that could trace back that far. And with all the degrees and all of the successes and all the clout of family, how perfect it all was, he completed another sentence. He kept writing and thinking. He then remembered that it all turned it really turned. He was at the peak of everything. Then he found himself literally blind, sitting in a town that was foreign to him, in a house that he didn't even know what was going on in the house. His entire world collapsed. Everything that he worked for, I mean with laser focus, everything that he worked for was gone. It'd come down to absolutely nothing. Listen, and you could turn there if you want or if you just want to listen. It's Philippians chapter 3. This is the letter. He goes, finally, my brothers. He pauses. He's still thinking. Rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you, it's no trouble, and it's safe for you. Look out for the dogs, the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh, for we are circumcision, who worship the Spirit of God and the glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Though I myself, oh, I have reason for confidence in the flesh. If anyone else thinks he has any reason to be confident in living in who he is in the flesh of his life, if there was anyone, I have more. I was circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, Hebrew of Hebrews. As to the law, well, I was a Pharisee. As to zeal, I was persecuting the church. As to righteousness under the law, I was blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things, and I count them all as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him, the power of his resurrection, share in his suffering, become like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead." Heavenly Father, these few short minutes that we have together, would you please 
clear our minds for this brief time. Help us to focus on your text, on your words. Help us to grow, become more like you today. In Jesus' name, amen. That is a high standard of confession that he just gave us. But I don't want us to think that it's beyond. This is the deal. A lot of us rely on our honorable name. We rely on what we've accomplished, and this is for all ages. We accomplish something or a particular talent that we have. And we find, and here's the key, we find our worth in those things. The job or the career. We find worth in the way we raise a family. We find worth in a standing in a church, a standing in the community. And it's really hard for us not to do that. We, in our own minds, you have one woman who's excelled and she's a vice president of an organization and she's got an amazing car and she has two houses. We just can't help but to think that she has more made it than the one who just works the 55-hour weeks and it's hourly. In our minds, we imagine that as being more worthwhile than the other. It is so ingrained in us. I think it's because we hear it all week long. This is the only moment. You have 30, 40 minutes right now to hear the other side. It's got to be enough to get us through the week. Because you know that's not true, that worth is in a position at a job. You know that. I mean, you teach, you would flat out preach that. Or in money. We know that's not true. We define success. We define our value so much the way the world does. And Paul was genius on this letter because he drew this picture of himself with no exaggeration. And anyone Jewish listening he was just like, he's the man. And what he was doing, and we mentioned this on Wednesday night. We, we said this exact thing on Wednesday night in our Bible study. Paul was just lifting your chin up, just arranging it so that he can give you a... He set us up by bragging about all of these things. And think for a minute of what we brag about. Now, you know what? I mean, it's that we're most proud of. What are you most proud of? And we're like, yeah, I've been faithful at this job for so long, and it's a really good salary. I've really made it beyond what my parents, and I've, the things that we speak of, we have to be careful because they're all good things. It really is impressive that you made it that far in sports or in a job. It's impressive. We're not taking that away. What we're taking away is that doesn't give you value. All of that is rubbish with value. Value is found in relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ. Everything else, temporary. Everything else can go. So take a look at the first section of this. So what is worth bragging about? The first few verses, when he says, Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. And by the way, that phrase, rejoice in the Lord, is almost confessional. That's like an equivalent of Old Testament when they say, Praise the Lord, hallelujah. That's what hallelujah means. So if, if that day arises where I say something really good from this right here and you want to bust out with a hallelujah, how cool would that be, right? Thank you. Thank you. Set up so right. I had a buddy in Arizona. He has a, a 1989 Harley. He bought it brand new. He's ridden. And uh, on the fender it says hallelujah. 
I know, that's right. You get to mix the best of both worlds. But that's what this phrase is. It's rejoice in the Lord. It's one of those things you just say. They say something, yeah, rejoice in the Lord. Hallelujah. To write the same things to you is no trouble for me and is safe for you. So apparently he's already covered some of these things. He says, look out for the dogs. Don't think you're a dog. It's a miserable creature. That's how they viewed him. Yours is part of the family. To the rest of us, it's a miserable creature. But to you, look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. We're talking about the value of following the law, circumcision. It's actually a play on words. He says it, who mutilate the flesh. The word mutilate rhymes is very similar to the word circumcise. So he used that word we all know by the context of what he's talking about, but a little play going on. But look at that, verse 3. We are the circumcision. You're talking outside. No, it's us. It's inside. It's who we are, who worship by the Spirit of God and the glory of Christ and put no confidence in the flesh. Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh, If anyone thinks they have confidence in the flesh, I have more. Look at the list. Seven things. Circumcised on the eighth day. Not really his doing. He probably didn't have a lot to do with that. But it speaks to his heritage. His parents also followed the nth of the law. People of Israel. Tribe of Benjamin. Hebrew of Hebrews. Pharisee zeal persecutor, righteousness, blameless. This is fantastic. His listing of those things, he has so much. Contrast it to what we have. Those things that we boast about. You see, on, I have a feed on Facebook which are abandoned castles abandoned buildings. It's huge, gorgeous, that are now all run down. There it is. That's, that's about what it's worth. All that effort and energy we put into something. I actually Googled the first flat screen TVs of what they were worth. You would drop 20 grand for a plasma TV. How about that? Yet you throw it away. That computer that you wanted so bad, it's Tossed. There's nothing wrong with these things, but as we think of them as bringing worth, we want it, and then we want more of it. He's saying, I've done and accomplished everything, and none of it is worth anything compared to knowing Jesus. Sarah and I have been married for 33 years, 34 years this year, 34 years. So when we got married, we've never had a car payment in our life, which means that we drove horrible cars. (laughs) I'm not kidding. My first car, though, was a 78 Vet. That's not bad for a first car. But the Chevette isn't as great of a car as you think it is. Um, So she had a, uh, a Ford Escort. I had a Chevy Chevette. And then we had that 78 Impala forever. We had that up. We took it to Arizona with us. It didn't have AC in Phoenix. Exactly. So we shared that car forever. So this is what's ironic, and we finally realized it, is then there's bragging about what you don't have. Like, we'd see those with a brand new car, and they've got car payments, and we're bragging of the fact that we don't. And I'm like, okay, it has nothing to do with that. It's deeper than that. It's still on things. When we base value on things, the, the monk, the monasteries, that's what they do. They brag about what they don't have. They brag about their pain. And then you have the other extreme where they brag about the huge house and the cars and whatever. There is nothing inherently right or wrong about either. It's the heart. Where is your value? What gives you value? 
His value listed here is spectacular. It really is, for the Jewish person, he was the man. Look at verses 7 to 9. And it begs the question, is advancement really advancement? Is a promotion at work really up? Corporate ladder, it's up. Is it always, is it better? Well, a presumption is, of course it is. It's more money. If it's more money, it's better. Because of the value system is off. In verse 7, he says, but whatever gain I had, I counted, and I circled three times, he uses the word counted or considered. I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For the sake I've suffered the loss of all things and count, here's the third one, count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ, be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. This isn't the, uh, it's like a testimony night where the, um, the guy gets up and he says, uh, he goes, I came to know Jesus. And everyone's like, hallelujah. This would be a good time for it. Thank you. And uh, could, do you think the sound that we could have a button where we could just, hallelujah, hallelujah. It's 11.30, it's time to go. That would be another button we could do. The, um, it's the one who says, uh, I came to know Jesus. And, and since then, I've lost all my friends, and I've, I've lost my job. My life is miserable. Praise the Lord. And everyone's like, I don't think I'm interested. I don't think that's the Jesus and the following Jesus that I really want. It's not that kind. It's not the I consider it all loss and rubbish. As it, it's putting it into the priority of which it should be. Would have loved to have had a newer car back in the day. That would have been really, really fun. Turns out we should have. I mean, we probably should have because the value is not enjoy the good things. Yeah, even be proud. You got the advancement at work. That actually is a really good thing. This is where it changes, but it doesn't bring you value. It doesn't bring you worth. As fast as you get it, it can go away. We've said forever in ministry, and it's true in business, first, the day that you think that the place couldn't run without you, wherever that work is, the place can't run, that's the day that it can. Right then, the second you think that is the day it runs better without you. And then we get somewhere, and we're like, you know what? This, this This is amazing, and if I left... They're going to have a hard time replacing me. If you've thought that, you will be replaced with somebody with less education, less impressive, and they do a better job. They remember you for this long. It's, we sure miss you. We sure miss that person. Wasn't there somebody in that job before that? That's how fast it goes. All of these things, if we try to get our worth out of them, They're temporary, which then means our worth is temporary. Our worth is in Christ alone. And then we appreciate those things. I'll give you an example how practically that works. Uh, Years ago, in those early days of ministry, our, like, mentor, pastor, he used to say, he goes, people will come up and compliment you that you did a good job at something. You preach really good. He used to always say, don't believe your own press reports. He goes, be careful with those comments. If you live to be complimented at work, even around the house, if you look for compliments, you'll never get enough compliments. There'll never be enough. 
You could have 150 people in the room, and if 140 of them say, great message, all your mind is, what's with the other 10? Were they not listening? Did they not think the hallelujah thing was funny? <clears throat> because you're looking for it for value rather than, and this is what we learned early in ministry, <clears throat> after a message, and you never know. If you've done any public speaking, you walk away some days and go, okay, that might have been the worst 30 minutes anybody could have ever endured. Like, that was really, I feel like I reached a new low. And you leave, <clears throat> and it turns out it was great. Then the opposite. You think, yeah, I really nailed it. I wish that, you know, the cameras were on, because that was pretty impressive, and it was horrible. So you rely on input. And I've learned, I can't judge it. And when somebody ever says, hey, really nice message, I liked that point, I, in my mind, always receive it as thank you for saying that's very kind. And you could almost view my soul, my heart, look directly to God and say, thank you, that was nice of you to send that my way but I am fulfilled in you, not in what people say. That literally is a practical way to do it. Because if you and I end up living for the awards, we start living for the positive comments, you'll never get enough. Am I right? You, there is never enough. And that is true with advancement at work. That's true of money. We put it all into perspective. God, I'm driving a nice car. Thank you very much. You're amazing that I can drive that. But you are all I actually need. And he goes, you're right. Because little do we know, we're going to lose all those cars shortly. You're going to lose that job. Our value is found in him alone. He was an old 1600s, Blaise Pascal, at least is said to, is accredited to him, I've got a God-shaped hole in my heart. You've heard the phrase? I have a God-shaped hole in my heart. Try to fill it with anything else, it doesn't fit. But God will fill it. He will take care of that. I had a, uh, we have a friend. He was a good friend. He was older than us. I, I always uh, pointed out to him that the day Sarah was born was the day uh, that they went to the moon. They took off. The day they left for the moon. <clears throat> and when the Apollo 11 landed in the uh, North Pacific, I think, our friend was on a, in Vietnam, was on a ship and actually saw it. It was miles and miles away, but they literally saw it land. They saw all the steam because it was so hot. And we brought that up a lot because I'm like, dude, that's how much older you are than us. Sarah was born when you were out there fighting for us in America, uh, in Vietnam, I sat with him once, and we were sitting together in a beautiful setting in, in Slovakia. The Tetra Mountains are gorgeous. They separate Slovakia from Poland. And we were out in this beautiful setting, and we had a friend who was running off into the fields chasing deer, and he did that for hours. So we just sat and watched. He would disappear for 20, 30 minutes, and then we'd see him run, and then the deer ahead of him. It was hilarious. And my buddy, his job, his career uh, was custodian. And he'd owned his own business earlier in life. And he ended up settling in a small business and being over maintenance and custodial work. And we were just sitting there talking as a good friend. So I just simply said, do you, like, what do you want to do? Like, go from here. What, what do you, where do you go? Start your business, own business again, maybe? And we're sitting there casual, and he goes, uh, <clears throat> why? And we're just talking. I went, I don't know. I mean, 
advancement. I mean, a little more money, a little bit more for travel. He goes, no, no. He goes, I get to spend as much time with my family as I want. All of my needs are met. And that's when he said, he goes, I don't know why advancement is thought to be advancement. He goes, the Lord's been good to us. We're able to walk with the Lord. He had beautiful grown kids at the time, just, just out of the house, walking with the Lord. He goes, I'm not sure that life can get any better than this. And I went, yeah, I, I guess I see that. Because that's not what we tell our kids going to college. You, you really talk about why. <clears throat> going to college so that, just keep going, keep follow the trail so that I can get a good job, so that I can make good money. It's that path. And we all know it's not true. No, it's find what you are best at in your relationship with God through faith in Jesus. You're equipped to do something, and college could ruin that. Absolutely ruin it. The trade school is so ideal for you because you're finding your place in your relationship with God. What do you want me to do? Because I want to please you. And if I'm pleasing you, that hole in my heart, the God-shaped hole, is full. And in this guy's case, it was being a custodian. He goes, he goes Rob, I literally don't miss any of my girls' basketball games because I leave and go to the basketball game, and then I just come back. He goes, I've missed nothing. He goes, there's value in life. And I don't know why that's refreshing to hear. It should be boring to hear. We should be saying this all the time. What's advancement? Life's worth is knowing and, if you look at your notes, look at that third point, it's, it's knowing and keep knowing Christ. There's a reason why it's phrased that way. Take a look at these verses, and it's important to note, it says, that I may know him and the power or the effectiveness, the efficacy of the resurrection and may share in his suffering, becoming like him in his death. You see, those are targets. Our target is let's avoid as much suffering as we possibly can. And when there is a bit of suffering, we rally the troops to pray us out of it. Success is out of the suffering. When it should be, success is that I grow and learn and endure suffering until he sees fit for it to be over, of which it may never be over, because you may be in the wheelchair for good. You may never be able to see. You can't use the arm. It, suffering, if we send the message that we just endure it until we pray it away. No, he doesn't say that. <clears throat> he says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection share in his sufferings, even becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, I attain the resurrection from the dead. The word know, <clears throat> excuse me, is used twice in this passage. It's used in verse 8. Uh, I indeed, I count everything as a loss because of surpassing worth of knowing Christ, and then here it is in 10, that I may know him. It's a really simple, <clears throat> two most common words for know, K-N-O-W, in the Bible <clears throat> are very different spellings, very different words. One is oida, the other is gnosko. They're very different. In fact, there are verses, I'll read one in a minute, where they're both used in the same verse because he's contrasting the two. Oida is to know factually something. It's kind of past tense. I know that Abraham Lincoln was the 16th president. Is that right? Okay, now I do know it. Okay, <clears throat> so he's the 16th. That's oida. I know it. You know it, and it's done. It's, it's a fact. Then there's a no, which is gnosko. 
gnosko is <clears throat> experientially know and progressively know. So think of the difference. You could oida about a kiss. You could know about a kiss. The facts of it. I understand it. Or you could know it, gnosko, experience, and progressive. He uses the progressive, the experiential. So I want you to flip over so you can grasp this completely. I want you to look over to John 17. We're going to take a little sidetrack here to John 17. Take a look at John 17, verse 3. And it says, And this is eternal life, that you may, that they know you, the only true God, Jesus Christ, whom you've sent. This is eternal life, that they may progressively know and experience. It's not a past tense, oh, I know him. Oh, yeah, I already met him past tense. But there are places, and it's worth noting, it's John 14, 7 uses both of them. So take a look at John 14, 7. In John 14, 7, and this is a verse you will be familiar with. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. If you'd known me, if you've had experiential knowledge and progress in knowing me, you would have absolutely, as a matter of fact, known the Father. So this is what's impressive about Paul. You go back to Philippians when he says, I want to know the power of the resurrection. I want to know Christ. What he's saying, it's not, hey, I did that. I'm just now again boasting. I've done these things, and I've already experienced Christ. That's past tense. No, I am growing experientially and progressing. I want to keep knowing him. I want to keep growing with him. If there's a word that should never take place in the Christian life, it's plateau. We should never plateau. We reach a point in which, yeah, we knew all those things. We've heard all of that. That turns into oida. I know him. No, I know him. I have a relationship with him. It's progressing it's growing. You want worth. You want value in life. Contentment. Progressively be in contact and grow in your relationship with God through faith in Jesus. Okay, you agree with the sentence, right? I mean, we're in church. It's progressively know and grow in your relationship with God through faith in Jesus. There it is. But we look at our last week, and I'll tell you, just you sit down and tell me honestly your schedule last week, and I'll respond by simply telling you whether or not you're living that sentence or not. It's that easy. Because we spend our time in things that we think bring us value. And if the only time we're opening our Bible is on Sunday morning, if, the only, if we're not finding our time alone with him and growing in that relationship to gnosko, to grow and progressively experience God, then that's not where our value is. And it's not to make us feel guilty. We're trying to save us all from the heartache of then when you lose your family or you lose your job or you lose your health and that's where all your value was, it's being set up for horrible devastation. Because too many of us in this room can vouch for the fact that, yeah, I did. I thought I had it all. I have nothing. Or I didn't know that my health was that important, and now I don't have it. And we realize it is all worthless. 
It's all found in our relationship with God through faith in Jesus. I spent a few days on a, a national team of five people, and we went into a church to evaluate it. So we spend a season in there's small groups everywhere, and we're interviewing and listening to people. We just want to hear the story. And as a team, we all got together. It was an early morning at the hotel that we were staying at. We got together, and we're like, okay, let's bring, up, let's bring all our ideas together. And it was quiet, and we're like, um, boy, this is a tough one. And I said, yeah, I, I'll start. I think this was a great, great time because I appreciate my church more than I have ever appreciated a church because this one's in big trouble. And they kind of half laughed. And listen to these phrases. is a criticism, observation of the church. A 20-year church, this typified, a 20-year church attendee of the church 20 years attending, considers himself, herself, as mature and healthy. A 20-year church attendee, by the way, who has never led or discipled a new believer in their faith, which is neither mature or healthy. There's this card stacking of values that we place. Yeah, they've been in the church 20 years. They've taught and they've done this. and Those are all super good things. But is that where value is? Is that where value is value the fact that you were faithful for 30 years teaching something? We're back to the Pharisee thing again. There is only one thing. It is your personal connection with God through faith in Jesus Christ. There's your value. <clears throat> if the whole world, if the whole world turned to God through faith in Jesus and you didn't, God be looking for you. Because he loves you. He wants you. The value that we have is that we're reunited with our creator because he created us in such a way that we are complete in him. And then everything else, the car, the finances, the debt, the relationships, good and bad and good eating and bad eating, all of that falls into place. And we appreciate all the wonderful things of life, but none of our value comes from it. It comes from our personal relationship with God, with faith in Jesus Christ. And I'm going to tell you, you're not going to hear that the rest of the week. Unless you're on a Christian radio station or you're catching uh, David Jeremiah or somebody, you're not going to hear it because we only hear it here. The bad news is we're going to live it one way or the other. And come Tuesday, Wednesday morning, when you wake up on the treadmill of your day and live another day, it's, you look at your class schedule and there's things after school, before school, and you've got just the standard, and you realize, you know what? None of this includes any of my time with God at all. The very relationship that brings me worth, I'm excluding from my days. And for maybe most of you, that you're, you're reading a devotional, you're listening to Christian radio, you're doing what you can to keep the value straight. Good for you. Keep going. Keep going. And maybe find people around you to bring along with you. Because too many of us aren't. Too many of us hear this thing of Paul, and it's exciting, but the truth is we're not living it. And my prayer is that we all do that we all live this week, enjoy the good things of life, but know that all of your value, you are irreplaceable in your relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ. And you agree with me, right? How about a hallelujah? Ah, look at that, comes around. And I didn't even hear them this time. You needed the button. Going to have to have the button. <laughs> Let me pray for us.
If you've never received Jesus Christ as your Savior, it starts there. Maybe you've gone to church, maybe you don't. You can come into a relationship with God through faith in Jesus even right now in your heart. Tell him this. Say, Heavenly Father, I need you. Thank you for Jesus, his death for me. I trust him for my eternal life, for saving me, for my relationship with you, God. I give you my life. And Heavenly Father, for the rest of us, that we prioritize this week our relationship with you that we know brings us all of our value and worth. In Jesus' name, amen.